in a crime that the U.S. Senate described as the worst terrorist attack on U.S. soil since September 11th, Nadal Hassan carried out a brutal ambush on dozens of U.S. soldiers. The case of Hassan is an interesting one to say the least. He was an Army Medical Corps psychiatrist, yet clearly struggled with his own mental health in his six years on the job. Not only that, but he was observed by colleagues having anti-American views, which is curious considering he was serving in the U.S. Army. These views would worsen along with his apparent radicalization until they came to a deadly peak on November 5th, 2009. Welcome to 10 Minute Murder, brief and bingeable true crime. I'm Joe, the host, and I appreciate you joining the podcast today. If you're new here, you'll notice that after you become a subscriber, positive things will start to happen in your life. For example, you'll think, hey, I'd like to listen to a podcast right now. Open your podcast listening app and boom, almost as if magic, 10 Minute Murder is right there waiting for you with new episodes about interesting stories. What I'm saying is the world is your oyster. I don't really know what that means, but I've heard someone smart say it before. And I don't really like oysters. Um, I don't think I've ever eaten an oyster, but it seems like something I wouldn't like. It looks like, well, you know what it looks like. And you and I both know that God did not mean for us to be eating those snotty looking things. Did they taste like snot? Probably. I bet they do. They look like it. I don't know. Anyway, go to 10minutemurder.com. Find links to all things related to this podcast. Now, let's get to the story today. Nadal Hassan was born on September 8, 1970, in Virginia, to Palestinian immigrant parents who ran a store and a restaurant. Hassan enlisted in the Army immediately after he graduated from high school. He served for eight years before he transitioned to Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences to begin his medical degree. In May of 2001, Hassan's mother passed away, which devastated him. It's said that after this, he became more in touch with the drastically conservative side sometimes extremist side of his religion. He also at this time began searching for a wife, but struggled to find a woman who agreed with his increasingly conservative attitude. The Islam that he began to associate with was the kind that was infamously preached at a mosque, which was known as one that was attended by two of the men that hijacked the planes involved in 9-11. Ironically, it appeared that Hassan's work as an army psychologist may have been detrimental to his own mental health as a whole. His cousin said that Hassan was hearing stories about the horrors of war on a daily basis from his colleagues returning from Afghanistan and Iraq. As a result of that, he began to fear being deployed himself and his performance in his job suffered. At this time, concerns were raised regarding his work and his belief. Despite this, Hassan's superiors continued to promote him. In 2008 and 2009, Hassan's radicalization led him to gain contact with a cleric from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula named Anwar al-Awlaki. Al-Awlaki was a preacher of very extremist beliefs and was powerfully vocal of his support of violence in response to the U.S. government's foreign policy. In his lifetime, he was wanted by several countries, including the U.S. and Yemen, with a Yemeni judge ordering him to be captured, dead or alive, in 2010. Hassan spoke to al-Awlaki through email on more than one occasion in 2008 and 2009 asking about whether serving in the U.S. Army was compatible with being a Muslim and whether it would make someone a martyr if they died while attacking other soldiers. These emails were intercepted by the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force in San Diego. A note of this contact was made and put into a file which went untouched for two months until an agent in the Defense Criminal Investigative Services was assigned to it. The DCIS, though, was simply meant to deal with fraud and cybercrime amongst the military and was in way over its head with the kind of terrorism threat that Hassan posed. While this was going on, Hassan continued to email al-Awlaki. He sent more than a dozen emails, while al-Awlaki only responded twice. Which is similar to, I think we all have at least one or two people in our Instagram or Facebook DMs that's just kind of talking to themselves. You don't really respond that much, uh, but they're just in there talking. It's a similar situation with Hassan and al-Awlaki, but he's not trying to take him to Topgolf. He's trying to figure out if he can kill soldiers and become a martyr. One message in 2009 said, Hamas and the Muslims hate to hurt the innocent, but they have no choice. 
and this was also intercepted by the FBI's database, but didn't link it to the ones he sent in 2008, so they didn't realize that it's the same person. While this was being logged, the DCIS agent put off his inquiry for another 90 whole days, which is the maximum amount of time that an agent can delay one. After this, it appeared that he carried out a, frankly, pretty superficial investigation. The investigation involved searching for Hassan's name for a few hours in late May 2009, running it through some of the databases and reviewing his personnel file. However, the assessments of Hassan by his superiors were largely positive, so he concluded that Hassan had contacted Al-Awlaki for his academic research on Islam and no further action was taken. Around that time that this investigation was concluded in, Hassan sent another email where he told of another speaker who he'd heard defending suicide bombings as permissible. This was picked up by an FBI agent who failed to link it back to the other emails again. However, two weeks later on June 11th, this agent found Hassan's file and was shocked that the investigation had not gone further. They contacted the DCIS and asked why, almost insisting that further investigation needs to be done. The DCIS rejected this. The FBI agent didn't take it any further. And for the record, this is not me being critical of the FBI or the DCIS. They didn't have to be this transparent and let the public know about their internal workings as it relates to this, but they were, and it shows to me that they were trying to fix the problems internally and take accountability for any mistakes made. In mid-June, Hassan purchased an FN Herstal 5.7 semi-automatic pistol and ammo, both of which were known to be armor-piercing. He was also transferred to Fort Hood in Texas around this time. It wasn't until November that he carried out the plan that he seemed to have been putting together for perhaps a year. On November 5th, he walked into a Fort Hood medical building and opened fire. Nadal Hassan killed 13 that day including a 21-year-old pregnant woman who cried out for her unborn child as she was shot to death. He also wounded 30 others, shooting at least five victims while they were lying on the floor. He fired over 200 times before being confronted by two Department of the Army police officers, Kimberly Munley and Mark Todd. Munley began to return fire and managed to shoot him until she was shot twice herself in the leg and collapsed to the ground. Then Todd was also able to shoot Hassan which put him on the ground and gave Todd the opportunity to kick the gun away and handcuff him until more help arrived. That help was just a little bit too late. In just 10 minutes, Nadal Hassan had committed the deadliest mass shooting at a U.S. military base. The shots that Hassan received paralyzed him from the waist down, and he had to receive extensive medical help in the subsequent months. However, he was soon charged with 13 counts of premeditated murder and 32 counts of attempted murder. Nadal Hassan attempted to plead guilty. However, military rules surrounding the death penalty mean that guilty pleas aren't accepted, and so Nadal Hassan was taken to trial. At the trial, he acted as his own attorney, because of course he did. He also called no witnesses, declined to make any statements, and had no testimony. What he did do was open with a remark where he said that he committed the crime and that he had chosen to, quote, switch sides on the alleged U.S. war against Islam. He also claimed to have carried out the attack in a preemptive attempt to save Taliban militants that the soldier would be fighting in Afghanistan. Over 100 witnesses were called by the prosecution, though, with 20 of those being surviving victims or relatives of the deceased. One of the victims was Staff Sergeant Patrick Ziegler, who was shot four times. He had more than 20% of his brain removed in surgery in order to save his life, and he told the court, quote, I was expected to either die or remain in a vegetative state. Another person on the stand was the father of Private Francesca Velez, the pregnant 21-year-old. He told of how her death and the death of his future granddaughter has impacted him and his family. In court, Hassan's history and radicalization was unveiled, including the emails that he exchanged with Al-Awlaki. Alongside that, it was also revealed that he had prepared in the lead-up to the attack by attending a shooting range and researching jihad online. In August 2013, Nadal Hassan was sentenced to death for the deaths of 13 people and wounding 32 others. The panel, which was made up of 13 senior military officers, made a unanimous decision in less than two hours. The pay and other military benefits that he received while in custody were also stripped from him. When, or if, Hassan is executed, he will be the first since 1961, and he is one of only five on death row.
That's 10 Minute Murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. Thank you for listening today. And as a side note, um, I've mentioned on this podcast in the past how my father was in the army when I was growing up. And he was actually stationed at Fort Hood twice in his military career, which means I've lived in Fort Hood or the surrounding area, Colleen and Coppers Cove. I've lived there a couple of times in my life. While the, the base does not have the best um, reputation, those are some of the best times in my life that I remember being there. Obviously, I had a very different experience being a child and not an adult living there. But it's interesting how some of these cases can intersect with your own personal life, uh, even if it's in some small fashion. Hey, if you're brand new to this podcast, first of all, I really appreciate you listening today. And second, become a subscriber. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please subscribe wherever you're listening and you won't miss a single future episode. Also, connect with 10 Minute Murder on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. All those links are in the show notes. You can go to 10minutemurder.com and find those links or just as easily. You can just type it into the search bar in any of those platforms that you're trying to connect with 10 Minute Murder and it's going to pop right up. Thank you for listening. Be safe and make good choices.